Um, so this is a, a small town near um, the farmers I just showed you. This is an example of a municipal market, the kind of public investment that you would historically see in every town, um, the marketplace. As you can see, there's one beautiful, vibrant, but kind of meager fruit vendor. Um, there's more DVDs being sold than fruits and vegetables. Um, a lot of these markets once were three, four days a week. Some of them even, you know, in the big cities, they would be daily. Um, now, some of them, it's once a week or, or less often. Um, people are just not purchasing as much um, fresh fruit and vegetables in this kind of setting. Um, this is uh, my friend's town. Um, this is Doña Yolanda, who's a widow um, who has a little store. Um, but, you know, if we take Michael Pollan's definition of food that your grandmother would call food, there's not that much in the picture. And most of it is provided um, by Bimbo in this case. Bimbo, Coca Cola, Pepsi deliver the signage, the racks, the, the, the products. Um, these products are shelf stable, they won't go bad. Um, her neighbors, you know, her best customers are children who get a little pocket money, you know, a couple times a week and come in and buy some candy. Um, most of her neighbors do not buy significant amounts of food from her because they're, they go to Walmart. Um, there's uh, in Tehuacan, which is 15 minutes on the public bus from her small town, um, there are four Walmarts one on each corner of the town. So each road, this is a market capital going back pre, before the Spanish. Um, the same roads that farmers used to take from the highlands and the lowlands throughout the valley and the hills to get to the market um, now are, uh, you have to pass a Walmart to get into town. Um, Walmart is the largest um, food, food seller, food retailer um, in Mexico, and um, there are, uh, I can't remember the number offhand, I can look it up. Um, and then we have, this is another example of sort of a hybrid um, kind of food situation. So we have um, the Doritos, <coughs> the advertisement for Dorilocos, which, you know, Lest my students think I'm some sort of health food zealot, I think Dorilocos are the most genius human innovation. <laughs> um, you take a bag of Doritos, you layer it with cucumber and mango and lime, and you know you eat it with a fork. It's quite brilliant, um, horrifying genius, all in one. Um, but we see, you know, these Doritos. We see um, we see homemade junk food, right? The homemade potato chips and the homemade Cheetos, um, and then we see flayudas. Right, the advertisement for Rica's Flayudas, and we see Flayudas and Flacoyos in these styrofoam plates, and those are corn, ground corn that are you know filled and stuffed, maybe with lentils, um, with cheese, with cactus leaf. Um, they'll be topped with lots of different things. So we have fresh, processed, homemade, um, multinational corporations, etc. <coughs> So when I showed you the tortillas in the little store, um, they probably came from a place like this. Um, this is a different town, but this is a very typical tortilleria. Today, it's almost impossible to find a tortilleria, um, a tortilla factory that grinds its own corn. Um, most tortillas um, in Mexico today, I think it's uh, um, upwards of 80%, are made from dried industrial corn flour. Um, so you see, you know, kind of appropriately, the sacks of processed corn flour, um, and you can see the, you know, the Coke bottles, and you know, these are sorts of um, both examples of of, um, of old industrialization of the food system because um, when Mexico began to be really urbanized in the 50s and Mexico City became the Mex the mega city that it is today. Um, the Mexican government invested very heavily in developing the technology to store corn flour under the idea that you needed, you know, that people would starve if they couldn't eat enough tortillas. And so there had to be a way to store corn flour so that food production could be more industrialized, could be more efficient, and enable people to get off of the, the small scale country um, uh, peasant uh, land holdings. Um, 
And so we see, um, you know, this, this kind of industrial corn flour. Unfortunately, today, they've, even though Mexico has a ban on GMO corn, um, to, they did a study recently, and almost all of the um, corn flour in this format is actually um, uh, tainted with glyphosate, with Roundup. So somehow, either U.S. corn is getting into those sacks, or people are growing um, Monsanto seeds in Mexico, which is against the law, but probably is happening. Um, <clears throat> and then this is the other um, kind of food retail environment, which is the OXO, which is similar to an AMPM or a you know gas station. Um, OXO opens three stores per day <coughs> in, in, in the Republic of Mexico, and you know similar to the tienda, more so than the tienda, you would be hard pressed to find something that your grandmother would call food. Um, you know, these, we're familiar with these sorts of stores, um, you know, from the U.S. context along the side of a highway, you'll find plenty of soda, beer, chips, and ice, um, but not really anything fresh. Um, this is the Walmart uh, Coke aisle <laughs> um, in Zeragan. Um, and then this is outside of Yolanda's store, um, right, so this is the Coca-Cola distribution truck, which people in the town say is the first thing that came to town when the roads were paved, which was relatively recently. Um, and, and Coke, um, six pesos per liter, so it's, it's pennies for a liter. Um, and there's, uh, you know, if you go, if you travel from the urban to the rural area, you'll notice that in rural areas, especially in indigenous communities, it's discounted. It's cheaper to buy Coke in rural and indigenous communities than it is in cities. Uh, describe him as the Ralph Nader of Mexico. He's a uh, consumer advocate who runs an organization called Poder del Consumidor, Power of the Consumer. Um, and this was, you know, an action that they did near Christmas time. They had someone dressed as Santa Claus, you know, like the Coke commercials that have Santa Claus. Um, and then they, but they, you know, had the can with the diabetes and the Coke logo. Um, so they've done a very good job of drawing attention to the relationship uh, between soda and diabetes um, and uh, the health consequences. Um, I wanna talk a little bit, just connect the dots a little bit more in terms of how this is related to NAFTA. Um, so this is an example of um, a, a government agency that's, that's a product of NAFTA um, that's an engine of NAFTA, it's, it's part of the um, Commerce Ministry, and it's uh, called Con Mexico with Mexico, and its purpose is to um, promote, you know, as it says in their mission there, to promote the development of consumer goods, the consumer goods industry in Mexico. So this is sort of their vision right, of, of post-NAFTA Mexico, the modernity and prosperity um, that NAFTA is supposed to bring. And so if we think about what kind of um, lifestyle is being envisioned, you know, the nuclear family, white, you know, uh, European features, um, uh, going to the supermarket together, right, uh, the mother, you know, reading the label because you know, it's not the government's job to make sure that everything in that store is healthy, right? So it's the consumer responsibility to navigate this, you know, enhanced landscape of choice, of consumer availability, of, bio, of product diversity. Um, and so, you know, this idea of, you know, kind of shopping as a family activity, as a kind of community, as a kind of belonging and expression, um, modernity, um, and, um, you know, this is what they're promoting, and they're being very successful at it. So even though um, Mexico, the rate of poverty in Mexico has risen since NAFTA, um, remember, you know, promised prosperity, um, the, the rate of poverty has, has risen, the median income has actually fallen in real dollars, the median income has fallen since NAFTA. Countries in Latin America that didn't sign a trade agreement have seen double-digit decreases in poverty in the last 25 years in the same period, um, so, and Mexico has seen an increase in poverty. So it's actually been the opposite effect. Um, but some people are doing great. So overall, Mexico is wealthier 
with incredibly um, exacerbated income inequality. Um, and we can see that you know, the food industry is happy. Um, <laughs> The aeronautics industry is happy, the computer chips and, and um, you know, lots of um, uh, manufacturing industries are happy. Um, we've seen a steady rise of, you know, of processed foods. Um, and again, you know, correlation is not causation, um, but there's a very um, close correlation <laughs> in the rise of you know, just about everything that we're talking about. The, if we look only at sugar and, and how much sugar and uh, sugar sweetened, um, rather uh, sweeteners uh, like corn syrups, um, we'll see a similar correlation. If we look at um, foreign direct investment in the food industry, we'll see a similar correlation. And processed foods in general. So again, not just U.S. industries, but Bimbo, which you know is an example of a NAFTA beneficiary that goes both directions. I don't know if you know, Bimbo owns Entenmann's. And so we've kind of had, you know, an, uh, much greater access to bimbo products as a result of NAFTA, um, the same way that Mexico has had greater access to, to uh, U.S. corporate foods and beverages. Um, and the consequences have been um, significant. So we hear um, ad nauseum, you know, in our media and, you know, even on, you know, and, and movies and, and, and Netflix, right, about narco culture and narco and the drug war and Chapo is you know ubiquitous in our in our public discourse um, but we don't hear about the slow death of, of diabetes and in fact um, uh, diabetes claims more lives per year than the drug war in all the years um, put together. This is um, idiopathic kidney disease, so it's unknown what the cause is. It's not genetic. Um, there's uh, emergent evidence that it has to do with, um, and there's, there's sort of an epidemic that's happening in, in Central America, India, Mexico, and it seems to be very closely correlated with the um, onset of the use of specific chemicals um, in agricultural um, production um, that seems to be associated with kidney failure. So a lot of the kidney disease is people in their, in their teens and 20s who don't have any gen genetic predisposition. Um, Mexico has one of the highest rates of, of kidney failure. And so all of these, um, not all, but many of the um, non-communicable diseases are framed as um, diet-related and are, are framed as aspects, of as aspects of individual behavior. Um, and so there's something um, handy about um, the economy being transformed and yet the effects are things that can be attributed to people having a sweet tooth or being more sedentary or changing lifestyles or um, you know, needing to be educated about health and nutrition um, and exercise and that's what we're seeing in Mexico. Um, so we see a rise, um, you know, a decline in um, not in communicable diseases, lower respiratory infections, um, things like that, and we see an increase in um, non-communicable diseases. So kidney disease, diabetes, heart disease are all up quite significantly. Um, this is an example of the Mexican Health Ministries um, marketing uh, communication strategy to try to raise awareness about the toll that diabetes is taking on the Mexican population. Um, we see, you know, in terms of costs, in terms of um, disability related um, um, loss of both loss of productivity as well as medical costs. Um, we see uh, the incredible um, increase in uh, child <coughs> diagnosis diagnoses of type 2 diabetes in children. Um, we see, and a lot of this is accompanied by um, what is really, you know, a product of, of, our, of this time period in history, which is um, you can see people that are suffering both from poverty diseases, so, you know, lack of access to sufficient nutrition um, with uh, affluence diseases such as um, diabetes, which are often associated, at least in the imagination, with excess of, of um, consumption. 
Um, and so, you know, people who have, uh, you know, micronutrient deficiencies, people who have, um, and in fact, there seems to be an association between um, experiences of hunger in childhood and the way that the body um, later metabolizes um, uh, sugars later in life, um, creating a greater predisposition. Um, I want to just, you know, show you both uh, the kind of way that this is being visualized, right, in terms of this, you know, kind of macabre, leave it to, you know, Mexican culture to, to go right for the, you know, really dark <laughs> imagery. Um, but we see this, um, you know, kind of very official uh, imagery that indicates the severity of the problem. But we also see imp implicit in this the etiology, right, the understanding of where the disease is coming from. Because we see the logo, which I don't think, you know, would, would be politically correct here, we see this logo associating overweight and obesity with diabetes, right? And, and we see this very explicit kind of framing, 80% of diabetes is caused by overweight and obesity. Um, so this is part of a national strategy that's developed by the health ministry um, in 2014, 2014, it's late 2013, early 2014, it's launch. Um, and it quickly gets the attention of very progressive people all over the world, including people like Marian Nessel um, and, you know, a lot of my colleagues at CUNY Public Health who are really, you know, progressive, radical public health people who see what Mexico is doing and get very excited because Mexico becomes the first government, national government to pass a soda tax, which is considered one of the most kind of aggressive ways to combat the food and beverage in industries. And as we know from what happened with Bloomberg here, um, soda companies will do anything to, you know, kind of defeat these measures. So it was seen as sort of a win by a lot of progressives that this was passed in Mexico. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit of a different story briefly, which is that the tax and the whole strategy were developed um, with the opposition, the active opposition of the health minister herself. The health minister was formerly with Fun Salud, which is the health foundation of the Nestle Corporation. Um, the Coca-Cola company, Pepsi-Cola, Bimbo were at the negotiating table. All the diet, all the nut public health people, nutritionists, um, Poder del Consumidor, the Ralph Nader guy, all of them were kicked out of the room when this was finalized but the soda and, and um, food co corporations were in the room and paid for lunch and <laughs> um, put fancy, you know, goodie bags on everyone's chairs. So this is, um, in some ways, I think, a, a newly innovative way of doing health policy because it has the soda tax that kind of gets, you know, progressive people excited that, that you know, something really big happened. But in reality, um, the overall policy is based on an understanding of non-communicable disease, which is 100% focused on the individual and individual choices, um, and blaming people for whom their entire world, right, their way of making a living, um, their society around them, the economy around them has been transformed, but then blaming them for suffering the consequences of those changes. Um, and so we see this you know, kind of framing of, you know, go to your medical checkups, moderate your food consumption, and move your body, right? So very similar to Michelle Obama when she was, you know, kind of do this comprehensive, you know, child obesity thing that got reduced to let's move, right? Because the soda and beverage companies are fine with exercise as long as no one tells anybody not to drink soda, right? Um, and so we see actually federal funded, federally funded yoga classes, and the public parks, Zumba classes in the public parks, um, but we see a disinvestment in basic medical care. Um, a lot of the families that I know in New York City um, who used to send their remittances to build their homes for retirement are now sending remittances to pay for dialysis um, because a lot of the public insurance won't cover um, you know, the long-term dialysis that so many of their relatives need as a result of advanced diabetes and kidney disease. Um, so, you know, just to think, uh, as we wrap up, I would like to open it up for discussion, but um, just to think about, you know, kind of alternative ideas. Um, one, I think, is to think about how the structural landscape 
um, how, how to better kind of point the finger back at the political decision making process, at the corporations that really don't care, right? You know, they, you can hear, you can, you can go on YouTube and hear the Pepsi, I don't know if she's still the CEO, but the Pepsi CEO talking about how, you know, I'm a mother and of course I want my children to, you know, drink water and so that's why we're offering a variety of healthy beverages. And meanwhile, they're doubling down on marketing to children in the developing world. Um, anywhere that it you know, looks like anything might happen as far as restrictions, regulations, they double down, they fight it tooth and nail. Um, there's been no big tobacco moment where they've kind of pulled back and acknowledged um, their role. And in fact, they take the t big tobacco example as a reason to get even more creative and even more wily in their um, approach to regulations. Um, and um, in their um, investment in alternative um, explanations, right? Because unlike the relationship between lung cancer and cigarettes, um, you know, diabetes is multifactorial, right? There's not, it's easier to kind of deflect the blame from their products, perhaps. Um, but there are social movements that are, you know, trying to um, change the narrative. And, um, you know, this is an example without corn, there's no country. Um, you know, peasant movements um, that are seeking to um, reassert the importance of corn, um, protection of corn from the um, GMO and um, patented seed um, pred predatory behaviors um, on the part of Monsanto and other places, uh, other co corporations. Um, you know, we see, um, you know, cultural ideas about, about eating in a decolonial way, about eating um, foods that are pre-Columbian as a pathway to health and to cultural expression and, and food sovereignty. Um, we see, uh, you know, the new president in Mexico talking about um, Mexico needing to be food sovereign, going from 41% of its food being imported, going back to, he, he says he wants 100% of um, food in Mexico to be produced in Mexico. Um, so very, you know, radical shifts. We can see why Trump was in a hurry to get the prior president to sign. Um, and then, you know, this is an example of sort of, you know, um, you know, using amaranth, which is a pre-Columbian seed. You know, it's one of these things like quinoa um, that's incredibly nutritious um, that, you know, is used um, in indigenous communities long before the Spanish arrival. And we see, you know, this is an example of sort of, you know, a high-end, um, you know, you can make French pastries with amaranth, but this sort of, you know, idea of kind of asserting um, the value in, um, in all sectors of the economy of, you know, kind of pre-Columbian ingredients and locally produced food. Um, and then I just want to close with the tamalada <laughs> picture and just, you know, thinking about uh, ways of eating that are not fast and not packaged and not processed. Um, that have a lot of cultural value. So I'll stop there. We can talk. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I knew nothing about this. My question is very simply. Uh -huh. Why are the regular people uh, buying junk foods at Walmart instead of uh, the traditional native uh, foods? Well, part of it is this kind of eating is very labor intensive. So there are good feminist reasons why can, packaged foods can seem like liberation, <laughs> right? Because um, a lot of the labor of the traditional way of eating fell to women. And so labor, you know, women's labor force participation has been aided by you know, things like tortilla factories and um, mo you know, being able to mine mole in a jar instead of hand grinding your, your sauces. Um, in, in places where, you know, there's a lot of um, corruption, for example, in the, in the water, in the, in the public regulation system, so food and, food and water inspection. So a lot of people don't trust that government officials are keeping the water supply safe. Is Walmart actually cheaper in, in so is it cheaper to go shopping at, at Walmart in Mexico? No, <laughs> it's not, yeah. It's sort of appalling to me. Um, 
-hmm. You know, I have I have kids, and I remember you know there there's a time when you have toddlers where you know like the going rate of like every single item. So I would know like down to the penny like how much that stroller costs and how much that stroller costs, and I would go into Mexican Walmart and be like, why is it twice the price here? So, so it yeah, yeah. Can yeah. you um, maybe comment a little bit on um, <coughs> how NAFTA actually impacted uh, the farming uh, of, of uh, uh, corn in Mexico? You probably touched on it, but I missed it. But yeah, no, I, that's okay. Um, uh, just just for, for us as groups of like Yeah. So there's a couple of very specific things. There's a lot, you know, that we could go on all day, but. Um, there's a couple of very specific significant things. So one is that Mexico did have an understanding of corn being um, symbolically and culturally important as well as the most important food staple in the Mexican diet. And so there was an understanding that if you disrupt the, Mex the small scale Mexican corn grower, there will be hunger if it's not handled properly. Um, with NAFTA, there was um, a mathematical um, modeling that was done that anticipated that a half a million people would be displaced from the countryside. So there was an understanding that there would be a certain amount of pain and that it would, that's how big it, the, the magnitude would be and that it would be okay because those people would be then incorporated into a changed economy and they would find other, other sectors in which to operate. So there was an understanding that, the, that corn growers in particular would be negatively impacted. Um, that was 1 20th of what how many people were actually displaced in the first decade of NAFTA. Um, so they were wrong uh, by a lot in their calculations, but they didn't anticipate that it would be painless. Um, was, that, was that at the time already calculated based on the fact that in the U.S. corn is subsidized? Yeah. So, so the yeah. idea was so, it's okay to, to displace half a well, million or... But they did, people. they did, they thought it through. <laughs> so they, what they did was they tried to basically design a series, and this is the, the thing that I think is perhaps the most evil thing that I, <laughs> my research revealed, um, is that uh, there was a, a planned um, ex, uh, extinction over time of the protections of the Mexican corn industry. So the idea was we can't just, you know, January 1st, 1994, open, you know, liberalize our corn industry, take away our subsidies, you know, stop um, investing in the corn sector and allow U.S. Um, cheap feed corn to come flooding in. Um, so that was, that was thought through. And so there was this staged extinction of all of the subsidies and tariffs over time so that it would be 2003 um, when the last protection would expire. So this was the, 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 the plan. Unfortunately, um, there, was a, uh, there was a drought and there was a peso crisis and you may remember the Mexican presidential candidate was assassinated and there, there were three or four giant things and a whole bunch of smaller things that happened in the same interval as NAFTA and um, and the corn crop was bad that year and so there were people ready and you know the infinite ways of what Naomi um, Klein calls disaster capitalism ready to kind of propose a different solution and so um, the staged extinction of protections was accelerated and in some cases suspended entirely. So um, we were, the United States was asked, asked by the Mexican government officially to help alleviate the corn deficit that Mexico had that year and then every other subsequent year. So in 2003, you know, I, when I started this project, I knew that the 2003 date as when, you know, kind of to be aware of when U.S. corn would come flooding into Mexico, and what I didn't realize is that it would come flooding in almost instantaneously after NAFTA was signed. Yeah. Um, just because I'm totally uninformed, so basically what the agreement was, or what part of the agreement was, was a replacement of the Mexican corn industry with the yeah. U.S. corn industry. Yeah. So the idea was Mexico would, you know, spend more energy manufacturing, you know, car parts, 
all of the you know electronics and whatever and the US it's it's the idea of comparative advantage and so the idea is essentially that if you're you know if your economy is better at doing something you should do all of that thing and other people you know it's, each place should kind of specialize in the thing it does best instead of each place doing everything um, so one illustration of this that I find kind of perverse is the former Mexican foreign minister was interviewed by um, Bloomberg magazine two years ago. Um, and he was asked, what is a food item that best illustrates NAFTA? And he said, a taco with guacamole. And Bloomberg said, why? And he said, well, the avocados are Mexican and the corn is from the United States. <laughs> so that's kind of the idea, right? That the US grows corn so efficiently that nobody else should bother. With powerful subsidies. With powerful subsidies. So it's not Which so I spend efficient. like a chapter, I'm not an economist, but I spend a chapter in the book basically saying, can somebody please explain to me what's efficient about pouring chemicals and million dollar tractors and federal subsidies into this industry and then calling it efficient and calling it, you know, worthwhile when Mexican corn growers have very small yields, the small scale corn growers have very small yields, but they don't input anything, right? If it's a very dry year, they might get a water truck to come twice during the, the season to water the, the field um, if, if, the rain, if there hasn't been enough rain, but there's no chemicals, there's no tractor, there's no subsidies anymore because we made them get rid of them. Um, I thought you said that um, GMO corn is illegal in Mexico. It is. I thought most of the corn we made in the United States, it grow in the United States, is it's, GMO corn. Yeah, so they don't, they're not supposed to grow it. So they have a, they have a uh, federal moratorium on growing it. Um, they're not eating. But, but it can be imported. So it's imported, actually, one of the biggest um, recipients is, is the livestock industry animal feed. Right. Is that because it's protected, the GMO corn, the like actual like uh, genetic compounds? Yeah, it, so like it's patented seeds, patented they're seeds. sterile um, because the evil, you know, engineers that patented them made it so you can't save the seeds. Mm. Um, so you can't replant them from year to year. So you have to keep going back and buying them. Yeah. And they, and they're, you know, they're also engineered to be Roundup ready so that you can douse them and Roundup and the weed killer Roundup so they don't have to be weeded, which is good when you have, you know, these endless cornfields in Iowa and you're using tractors. Um, so you don't have to weed manually. You just mm -hmm. use your um, plane to douse everything in Roundup. Mm. What, um, what's, so what's the new president's stance on it? And are you hopeful? Yeah. Uh, I am hopeful. Um, it's one of the few things that has me hopeful, actually, <laughs> in the world. Yeah, so he, um, he's been talking about wanting Mexico to be food sovereign again. Um, he wants Mexico to grow 100% of its food. He, so he has very, a couple of very concrete, encouraging things. Um, I'm a little, I haven't seen in the last couple weeks, you know, what he's been doing in the new year. Um, but... Um, he already, even before he took office in December, he um, created a fellowship program um, in which he was advertising for applicants who are agronomists, um, sociologists, anthropologists, storytellers, um, to apply for a, a government-funded fellowship in the countryside um, to gather indigenous knowledge about farming um, and healing and, you know, climate and uh, sustainability practices. Um, and Mexico has uh, a mandatory social service requirement. So any student who is in college can't graduate without doing a year of social service. Um, and so this would be one option that people would have would be this pro-rural um, um, service assignment. Um, and then he also uh, appointed the most incredible um, slate of people to the government ministries. So it's leading um, scholars mostly um, who are who are experts in um, in 
in the economy and in the rural sector. So the person in charge of the, imagine, the person in charge of the environment is an environmental scientist. Um, <laughs> what would that look like? Um, so, you know, whereas the pri there was a huge conflict of interest, you know, like we have here um, with the last presidency where virtually all of the government ministers were from industries. So they were, you know, it was the wolf in charge of the hen house every single time. Um, one is if you think there's anything like nefarious about this avocado craze that's <laughs> happening right now. Yeah, um, there, it's because of NAFTA. I mean, they're cheap because of NAFTA. Uh -huh. um, a lot of, it's, it's sad because a lot of people who came from Puebla in the early 90s, so this is just another example of the hypocrisy of NAFTA. So NAFTA was supposed, you know, supposed to liberalize trade, um, but Florida avocado growers were really anxious that if Mexican avocado growers could compete on an even playing field, they would be destroyed. So in the early 90s, um, avocados from Puebla didn't have, avocados from Mexico didn't have any restrictions. Um, and when NAFTA was being negotiated, Florida avocado growers said, we can't have a flood of Mexican avocados. We can't make it easier for them to get here. And so they actually blocked, um, you know, created new limitations on the importing to the U.S. of avocados from Mexico. So it became harder to get a, get a Mexican avocado after NAFTA initially. Um, and so a lot of the people who came from Puebla to the New York area, if you talk to them, maybe not them personally, but they probably know somebody who used to grow avocados. But avocados take, you know, 15 years or so to be viable. You have to plant and irrigate, you know, for a really long time before you get any fruit. It's a very long-term thing. And if you abandon the land for 15 years, you can't go back to it and, you know, cultivate again. And so um, there, that's done. So, so then, you know, fast forward 20 years, avocados are the thing, and we would probably eat all the avocados that we had could get our hands on. If there were more of them, we would eat more because <laughs> they're so popular. Um, but now, you know, we don't have Puebla avocados because that industry was decimated. And the people who are profiting now, it's Michoacan, which is the state that's very much a narco state. It's very embedded. It's the same economy as a lot of the, the drug cultivation and trafficking. And so it's very related, and there's a lot of um, organized crime that controls the avocados from Michoacan as well. Um, Driscoll's, uh, you brought up Driscoll's earlier. Yeah. I was wondering how Driscoll's is seen in Mexico. Well, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the tomatoes and berries, um, you know, just about everything we eat off season, the berries and, and peppers and limes and um, cucumbers and, and, and um, tomatoes are coming from these massive factory farms in northern, largely northern and northern central Mexico. And um, there was a big expose in the LA Times called um, Harvest of Shame, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a, a year and a half ago, that basically revealed the semi-slave-like conditions, slavery-like conditions. On these farms. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you know anything about the cooperative food cooperative movements or uh, consumer cooperative movements in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some. Um, so that amaranth project at the very end is a food cooperative. Um, one thing that NAFTA uh, got rid of. Uh, well didn't get rid of, but allowed for the dissolution of um, what are called the ejidos, which are the um, communal land holdings that were set up after the Mexican Revolution, which are a com they're, they're communally held uh, land that's based on, on um, who work the, those who work the land get the fruits of the land. Um, and it was a way of redistributing land to indigenous communities that had been you know, held um, and hoarded by, by private landowners before the revolution. Um, and so for most of the 20th century, um, that was the main way that people had access to land. Um, and it couldn't be sold or subdivided. Um, Salinas with NAFTA arranged for Congress to rewrite the Constitution to allow a lot of the ejidos to be dissolved. So that's 
evil, um, but there are still many ejidos, and those are a really fundamental kind of cooperative that's all over Mexico, um, and it's one of the most significant kinds of power um, that people have in rural communities. Um, and uh, so that's you know a very um, ubiquitous uh, form. But there are also there are a lot of um, communal and cooperative um, uh, models. So, for example, the corn, a lot of the corn mills and the markets are publicly or cooperatively owned. Um, and then there, and then things like the cooperative, like the Chile uh, producers I, I was mentioning, are a cooperative. Um, and then there are there are certain um, there used to be, and another thing that NAFTA got rid of purposefully was um, there used to be uh, a very robust system for uh, run by the Mexican federal government that was a essentially a matchmaker between rural producers and urban consumers, where the government would tra basically transport and provide price supports for produce from the countryside. So um, farmers would be guaranteed a, a price that they could live with, and it would be low enough for urban consumers to, to buy. Um, that was dismantled um, with NAFTA. But there are um, some small-scale versions of that that still survive, and the new president has talked about maybe reinstating some of that. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.